Hey, I should be live. I hope I'm live. Um, welcome, everybody, for our second show of the year. It's going to be a really good one. I'm really looking forward to hearing what Wes has to say. Um, somewhat um, related to that, we had, I think, somewhat of a momentous board meeting today. We, we passed a donation policy. Um, as many of you probably know, but some may not, is that uh, we are very active <laughs> In, in receiving cameras and in distributing cameras. Uh, this is how we fund uh, at least part of our FISNI. Um, the dues that we charge uh, for membership are very low, not nearly enough to cover our expenses. But we get donations. We always appreciate those. And uh, we always, uh, uh, we, we have to decide where those donations are gonna go to. Do they go on to something like eBay? Or do we save it for a photographic show? Uh, do we have private sales? And the board's been thinking about this for a while. We decide, you know, to to make it very uh, uh, very transparent, and also try to satisfy a need of our members who collect certain cameras or images or something like that. So I think we came up with a really great policy, and. Uh, and you probably get more information on this. Uh, for example, if you are looking for a certain camera, we get one. Uh, we, we have a policy now. It's, it's going to be very fair and open. Or uh, maybe we can uh, uh, get that camera into your hands. Um, but it will be uh, open to all, all the FISNI members. But you may get noticed that we get certain cameras. So I'm really looking forward to that. The other place where you may get a great camera is uh, upcoming Photographica show. Uh, that's coming up on the 22nd, I think it was, of, uh, of, of April. <clears throat> and uh, if there's anything like last year, uh, it, it's going to be great. Uh, uh, I was informed this morning at the board meeting, we had like 40 tables sold within uh, a couple of days of notices going out that we're having the show then. And we'll probably add another 100 or so uh, tables. So that's going to be great too. So if you're looking for a good cam camera, um, you could probably find one there on that date. And uh, with that, I think uh, I'm going to pass it back to uh, to Dana. Dana? Thanks, John. Looking forward to the photograph of that. Very exciting. Um, welcome, everyone. I'm Dana G. I'm the program coordinator for FISNI. And before uh, we welcome our speaker, Wes Loder, I just have a few announcements. Uh, the screen is being recorded for YouTube, as you probably saw when you logged on. Um, if you're new to Zoom, by moving your mouse or going to the bottom of your screen, you'll see um, the mute and the video controls on the left. Please stay muted during the presentation. Um, if you have a question for Wes as we go along, you can see the chat uh, feature at the bottom of the screen. It's the little speech balloon. Uh, please address your comments to everyone so that we can all see them. And uh, we'll answer the questions. I'll relay those to Wes at the end of the presentation. Um, and at the top right is the view icon. Speaker view is best for this presentation. Um, and then at the end, if you want to switch back to gallery view, like you may be in now, or you can see everyone, we can socialize a little bit. So um, about our speaker, uh, Wes Loder is a retired academic librarian, a longtime photographer and photographic historian. He started with Nikons in 1968. After he purchased a beat up Nikon 52 to use while cave exploring, he got interested in older rangefinder Nikons. And by the time he left the Air Force in 1971, he owned six Nikons and a number of lenses, 21 to 400 millimeters both for rangefinder and reflex, and had plans to become a full-time photographer and teacher. And while in graduate school, uh, first at Rochester Institute of Technology and then the U University of Oregon, um, he researched the history of Nikon. He became a librarian and ended up at Penn State for 26 years. His first book, The Nikon Camera in America, 1946 to 1953, McFarland Press, I have pasted the link for the Amazon uh, link to the book into the chat, as well as the links to Wes's blog and his uh, writing website. Uh, about 10X, in 2013, Wes purchased his first Zeiss 10X2, only to fall in love with the 24 by 24 format. He now owns a comprehensive collection of 10X, 
Today, a rare collectible, the 10X2 was the first 35 millimeter camera specifically designed for fast action, candid photography. Uh, Wes will discuss the camera, lenses, accessories, and potential use today. Um, Wes will explain why this camera is important to the history of 35 millimeter photography and how its features pioneered many of the operating features we take for granted in miniature cameras today. And with that, Wes, pass it to you. Muted here. There you can hear me, everybody. All right. And let's see, I will do this share screen here with the tank talk here. All right. Let's see. Take it away, Jimmy. All right. Let's see, where are we doing here? Share. Okay. All right. And we need to. I need to get over to this and play. Bingo. There we go. Okay, we're already on. Okay. Uh, I want to clarify a thing a little bit because some of you raised a question. Uh, the 10X2 was a camera designed uh, not as a special purpose. Uh, there were earlier 35 millimeter cameras that operated very quickly, particularly the robot, which is well known. But they were using motors and uh, they're really designed industrial cameras, and even though their ads played a little bit to the pub general public. But the, the 10X2 was really designed for the for a general public. Uh, but this talk that I'm going to be giving here uh, is that, um, well, first talk about the description of the photographic right. situation in uh, post-war Germany, uh, the situation that led to the creation of Zeiss Econ. Uh, I'll talk briefly about Zeiss Econ's problems with creating a miniature camera to compete against the Leica. And I'll then talk a little bit about Herbert Nuren. Uh, who designed many of the Zeiss cameras uh, in the 1930s. Uh, the 10X2 will maintain it was the full expression of Nerwin's philosophy of, of camera design. Uh, I'll then describe a little bit of the history of the camera itself. I'll describe some of the camera's unique characteristics. And then I will detail things like the lenses and accessories. And finally, I'll talk a little about my own experiences with the camera, uh, the joys and frustrations, and talk about the availability of the 10X today, things like prices and repair. Uh, the, all right, let's go, I can go. All right, Zeissico is founded by Carl Zeiss of Jana in 1926 at the request of the German government. What happened is in the post-war period, a lot of photography companies or camera companies in Germany that had prospered from lots of military contracts, suddenly found themselves up the creek. Uh, all of a sudden, uh, Germany was not in good shape economically, and a lot of the com companies were scrambling. And the government went to Carl Zeiss and said, we'll allow you to merge these three companies under one condition. You can't let anybody go. You can't let any workers go. So all of a sudden, they get three companies. They had already, Zeiss already owned ICA. In Dresden, but they now they had Erdmann and Ports and uh, Contessa, and so they were trying to put this thing together, and it took them a while to do it uh, to get everything together. Uh, in the meantime, so Zeiss kind of was making roll film, which the roll film cameras were very successful, movie cameras, plate cameras, uh, everything from almost large format all the way down, except they didn't make a miniature camera. And here's the Leica coming along. Doing very well using 35 millimeters cine film. Uh, so they, Zeiss so Econ, first thing they did, they tried to come out with a little 127 roll film camera called the Calibri. Uh, it was not successful, had a lot of problems. So then they turned to the design department and said, okay, let's do something next um, and let's bring out a 35 millimeter camera. And the result was the contacts, the first contacts. Um, which appeared in 1932. It was a full systems camera with a wide range of lenses. Uh, it had problems. Uh, it was not very successful. Uh, it was largely a product of the head of the design department, Heinz Hubenbender. Um, and also in 1932, Zeiss kind of hired a young engineer named Herbert Nerwin. Now what happened 
in the next two years, Nerwin was kind of working on ideas under Copenbender's guidance. In 1934, the director general of Zeisikon, who is Jewish, Emanuel Goldberg, was taken out in the woods. They beat the crap out of him, and Zeisikon said, this is going to last. He's not going to last very well with the Nazi government, so they sent him over to Paris, and Copenbender moved up to the head of the position. And a year later, Nerwin takes over the design department. And what he does, Nerwin does, first thing he does is he redesigns its contacts to make it more reliable, more uh, easier to handle, fit better in the hands, go into new chrome bodies, that's, cause that's the latest thing, and uh, turn it into a success. He then proceeded to design more cameras, as you probably, this, people here probably know all this stuff already. The, the Super Nettle, the, the, the Super Iconta series, and in time, the Netx and the Conaflex. Okay, but Nerwin was wanted to design a fast action 35 millimeter camera, a camera that would fit well into the hands and would have fully interchangeable lenses, but with a Compor shutter. Uh, nobody had really done that before, designed a 35 millimeter lens camera with a built in leaf shutter that was fully interchangeable lenses. And he wanted it to act instinctively, not have to worry about what you were doing or not doing. You just operate and take pictures, a true candid systems camera. Uh, he took the name uh, from uh, Gortz that used the 10X name. Uh, Zeiss kind of had a very, very bad habit of reusing names and reusing names. There's at least over the history of, of over the 20th century, there's probably at least three or four different 10X cameras. It gets rather confusing. Uh, by the way, this 10X camera that, that you see in the picture here came to me with all his film magazines. They're all loaded with film. I, I was didn't know whether they're exposed or not, and I didn't know what to do with them, but it's very kind of sweet. It, it's, uh, oh, it's the best pocket camera. Okay. He wanted the oper operation to be as easy as one, two. If you look at this illustration from the guy here, the one, two is the lever action and the shutter release. The idea was that you could take the camera, you could advance the film with your middle finger, fire a shot, advance the film, fire a shot. Uh, they said that you could get off a couple of shots a second. My experience is, yeah, you can get off about one shot a second if you're careful, but it's still the idea of a lever advance, a quick advance is something that's pretty novel in, a, in, a, in any sort of camera at that point when everybody is still using knobs. Um, and you know, People ask, well, why didn't they go to levers earlier? And I, I guess my comment on that is, is that up until the mid-1930s, film was pretty brittle. You had to be really careful advancing it. You couldn't just whip right through what you can with modern films now. And if you did that, you could break the film, and they were, then you're up the creek. So I, they tend to want to use knobs. And of course, with, uh, when you're looking at the back of the camera and trying to look through the ruby window when you're advancing, you really need to use a knob or something like that. But this was the sort of the philosophy he is doing. The other thing, in 1935, he finished this design for his dream camera, still solving problems. Like the Super Icondas, Super Nettles, and later NetX, he used external rotating prisms for focusing the range finder. Nice thing about that, it eliminates all the moving parts inside the camera, which had been a problem with the first contacts with its rotating mirror going out of whack. Uh, it would use a decal made Compor rapid shutter. Now, this is a, this was a big deal because uh, Zeissikon had bought Deckel um, in the 1930s under a deal that said Zeissikon for controlling Deckel, they would guarantee that they would use the Compor shutters on all their cameras. So Comp Deckel was looking at it and saying, you know, all your 35 millimeter cameras are using this focal plane roll top type desk shutter. Why aren't you using their Compor shutter that we, that was part of the deal. So the 10X in a sense was Zeissikon's reply to Deckel saying, oh yeah, we've got a 35 millimeter camera that uses a Compor rapid shutter. And you can see in the in this open body, it's set right in the middle, halfway between the focal plane and the lens mount. Uh, and there's a reason for that because if you, you know, the lens would tend to be deep seated. So you wanted the shutter as far back in the camera as you, as you could, but you still needed ex 
uh, space to allow the image to expand from the shutter onto the focal plane. So they sort of put it in the middle. They also went to 24 by 24 uh, because that way they didn't have to worry about vignette, vignetting as much. And this was a problem. It's also a problem with the robot. The robot's got the same problem. Uh, any focal length over 75 millimeters is likely to, to vignette. Uh, to do, solve that, they went to with a OSR shutter, which was really designed for a larger format for roll film instead of the O type that was used like in the retina. Um, and they of course went to 24 by 24, which with your working as a camera that does a lot of shooting, you want people to take a lot of pictures, getting 50 shots to a roll of film might make sense. But the tenets had some other modern features. And I would think that we have to think about what cameras were like then and how novel this was. For one thing, none of the lens rotate when you focus. How novel? You take a contact, when you focus it, the whole lens turns as you focus. The same thing with the early light, because all the early cameras had different lens rotated. Still, we're doing it in the 1950s, but all the lenses do not rotate. The aperture settings are equidistant. equidistant. Uh, the diaphragm is actually double with many leaves, so that when you're when you're moving the diaphragm, the spaces between the f stops remain the same. Again, how novel! Quick change bayonet, uh, combined range finder view for that offers a life size view. Does anybody know of a camera that actually had a full life size view through the viewfinder prior to the 10x? All these features made the camera very easy to use. Uh, and uh, so, and for the audience, I, I think it was really designed for women and families, you know, so you can take pictures of your kids, although it was used in sports too. Okay, so that's what they were trying to do with some of the features, and I'll get to this a little bit more later. The final result, they got approval, they said, yes, you can make it, and they started production in 1937. It was introduced to the European market in Light 6 trade fair in nine, April 1938. Now, keep in mind, in 1938, Germany and Europe were still at peace. So this was a, they, it was a chance to introduce a new camera during this peace and a strong market all over the world. And they reached the North American market that September. Oh, the production ranged over four years in three lots. The E series, which was made in 1937, there were 2,000 in it. Uh, the H series in 1938 had 3,000. The final J series had 4,500. They were made in 1939 into 1940. As you can see here, each year they were producing more. The market was there, they were selling it. So each year they said, well, we can produce a few more. Uh, uh, most of the J's, the, the H series is the one you most easily find today for some reason. Even though more J's were made, a lot of them went to the military or were converted for bar, dark boxes and they were just gone. Uh, to give an idea of terms of success, uh, the 10X2 is more common than the Super Nettle 2, the Natix, and the pre war kind of flex. Okay. Um, Keeping track of where I am here, okay. Uh, the camera, by the way, sold with, with the uh, F2 sonar for about $207, which is less than uh, the contacts sold with an equivalent sonar. But still, you're talking, the equivalent of today's price is about a $3,200 camera. was not cheap, but it was billed and sold as a high precision, uh, camera, and it was. Uh, the lenses that were sold, that sold these were four lenses they made. They, they prototyped a couple others, but they never actually manufactured. Uh, the first one was the, the 40 millimeter F2 sonar. And the point out here is that uh, the 40 millimeter gives you the same perspective as a 50 millimeter lens does for 24 by 36. It's the only one of the Zeiss Econ cameras offered with a normal sonar other than the contacts and the conoflex before the river. They were they prototyped a sonar for the for the, for the NetX. And they said, no, 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 you can't put a sonar on a cheaper camera, but they got it. Uh, this particular one here is coded, by the way, and it's a beautiful picture taker. Uh, the other normal was the 40 millimeter F2.8 Tessar. Uh, 
the records indicate a total of 6,800 sonar and 4,001 4, tessars were actually manufactured. Notice that the filter mount on all these lenses is exactly the same. You screw a filter in, uh, none of this looking down at the little lens here, trying to figure out how to change the diaphragm and what have you. Everything is uniform, really nice. The sole total of photo lens is a 75 millimeter F4 sonar. Uh, equivalent to a 94 millimeter lens. And I point out here that, you know, the 90 millimeter lens was the big, the most, the biggest seller for something like it if you wanted a telephoto lens. So it makes a little bit of sense there. 1200 made, about a couple hundred and one out in the robot mount after their manufacturer. So there's probably only about six or 700 that were sold to the, to the public. The orthometer was the only wide angle. Again, uh, the 27 millimeter uh, is equivalent to 34 millimeter lens and, and 24 by 36. 302 were manufactured. Um, there are two on sale on eBay right now if you're dying to get an orthometer. Uh, I spent, I think, four years looking for one before I finally got one at a price I was able to afford. It's a darling little lens. Uh, when I couldn't get an orthometer, what I did is I went to my local uh, machine shop. I gave him a 10X mount. I gave him an Econ mount and said, make me an adapter. And he did. And so I have an adapter. I can mount a 28 millimeter Nikkor on my 10X. And it, I, even you can't, there's no range finder focusing, obviously, but it actually produces very nice pictures. Uh, accessories. Uh, Again, it was a systems camera. There was a full range of accessory. Obviously, you had the 1339 contometer, the 1341 contometer, which was made for the Super Iconta, will also work because they both take 37 millimeter fit ons. Uh, there's, they had a range of filters, um, close up lenses, a waist level finder, and, and so on and so forth. Uh, take your pick. Uh, not as many accessories as the contacts, obviously, but. Um, not enough. Uh, all the 10X, uh, there are very, very little variation. They're almost all alike. Some from the North American market, they, are, have, they have quarter inch sockets in the bottom and the lenses are marked in feet. And uh, they say made in Germany on them. Uh, the biggest ones that are different were the ones that, they, that were used by the Kriegsmarine. Uh, the German Navy used a lot of them. Um, and they were popular there. They were, they were not used by the army. A few were used by the Luftwaffe, but not too many. All of them that are military have an added number on the back, either M or MF number. And that's the only way you can tell that they were used by the Kriegsmarine. Uh, finally, uh, there was a real shortage of film in wartime Germany. They went to Zeiss Econ and said, help us. We said, well, we got all these 10X sitting around. We'll make them into dark boxes with a special sonar lens and use them to photograph x-rays for detecting tuberculosis and stuff like that. And probably as many as a thousand of them were converted to this, these dark boxes. So that's pretty much what happened to all the camera here, uh, what the history of what happened. Uh, what, in 1945, the firebombing of Dresden wiped the Zeiss Econ factory out when all the dyes, castings, and water bodies were in hand were destroyed. And, and basically they never recovered at all from it. Okay, so the question is, what does this matter today? Or to put another way, why look for, bother to look for a rear camera that's at least 80 years old in a format that processors and slide mounts hate? Um, the answer is partly what I've just covered. This is a high quality 30 inch camera camera design that makes manual picture taking uh, easier than it ever been before. Uh, the sort of thing that said, hey, Henry, go get the camera, get some, look what the kids are doing, they're playing around, click, 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 and you, know, you, get, and you know, stop action picture. I mean, you look today, you get your digital camera, you get your phone out, and you can 20, 30 pictures later, you caught the action. Well, this was an attempt to be able to capture that same sort of action in a 35 millimeter camera. Almost all the features that I've noted here uh, to the camera, they're all standard features today. I mean, you know, you can pick up a 35 millimeter camera today and, and they all have rapid advances. They all have equal distance F stops and, and uh, non-rotating focuses and stuff like that. But this was the camera that really decided that, that this is the way you want to go. And it takes great pictures. Um, you can see here, there's an ad here in German here. 
pointing out the fast action capability. You can get click shots of Molly here with her little pet bear and stuff like that. Again, you can see taking pictures here myself uh, of my, my grandchildren, some of them. Uh, I'm able to capture that same sort of candid photography. Um, big, the ads that focus in the 10X keep pointing out that it was a sequence camera that you could take multiple pictures of a scene, uh, what have you. Of course, I use it for other stuff too, like macro. All right, and you can it take some very nice pictures. I like the square format for some reason or other. It's very enjoyable. Okay, this is 27 millimeter and 75 millimeter work. The 27 millimeter lens is it's flares. Uh, it's not. It's a little bit disappointing. The 75 flares too, but with a sunshade on it. You know, these are uncoated lenses. You know, you, you can't expect the best thing in the world. Okay, I haven't talked too much about. I haven't covered the 10x1, which was a also a a, a Neuroin, partly a Neuroin design that came out in 1939. It's a much simpler camera, and uh, it was a lot cheaper. It actually sold for about 60 bucks, and as a result, it was uh, they made something like 30,000 of them, and East Germany continued to make it all the way up to the mid 50s uh, because the place the equipment to make it wasn't destroyed. All this is detailed uh, in my book uh, that I made after I completed my collecting, the 10X2 ZC Precision Fast, and Fast Action Camera. Uh, it's available um, through Ingram. Uh, they has a connection to it. You can get, like, get it through Amazon. Uh, I, she's got a link ready, or you just go to Amazon, look under Westcott Loader, and you're going to find it. Uh, my the other book, of course, is the, the Nikon book that she mentioned, uh, which is this one here, published by McFarland. Uh, it came out in 2008, still in print and still selling. Uh, that really goes into detail about how the Nikon camera was developed in post-war Germany and post-war Japan. Uh, okay, uh, I'll be ready for questions here. And are you guys ready for show and tell? All right. Thank you, Wes. That was great. I'm going to stop stop sharing here if I can. All right. And put me back in full view here. How do I get by full view here? You stop sharing at the bottom. There you go. I can see you from full view now. Okay. So I'm on here. All right. Okay. All right. This is your 10X2. Uh, this is the one I use all the time. Uh, it's got a coated lens on it. Uh, the reason it's coated, if you look in the back, is it's got uh, an M number on it. This was a lens for the Kriegsmarine. Uh, and the, of course, the military got the uh, the pick of things like early, early coding. Uh, operation uh, is very simple. You have you have a, a lever for focusing, very similar to Leica, a lot faster than the focus wheel of a Contax. Uh, and um, you just uh, look up, you advance the film, and shoot. All right. Uh, advance the film, shoot. Advance the film, shoot. Uh, and uh, you can see the square. It's a life-size picture. You literally like life size. Very nice rangefinder spot. Uh, the bottom you see is exactly like a Contax or an Edex. It's got the two turns to open and close Contax cartridges, and uh, it has a take-up spool, so it operates inside only likely. It's got the lovely little Zeiss bumps in the back that we are all familiar with if you collect Zeiss cameras. Uh, going over. Here is the 75 millimeter lens. There's two ways to view it. There's a little clip-on thing here that shows you the field of a 75 millimeter lens that goes in the front. And so you can you can view and focus. They also made a uh, a finder on the top with an Albata finder on the top, which I, it doesn't work as well, but it operates the same way. Uh, focus with the lever, focus and shoot. Uh, very very nice compact, uh, and uh, with the sunshade on it, it works really nicely. This is the orthometer. Uh, 
It's very, again, takes the same filter size, very compact, uh, focuses down very close, uh, about th to three feet. Again, operates the same way, lever advanced uh, and with a separate finder. This is a really sweet lens. I just wish it was a little bit sharper. I do have filters on these things. Uh, the other normal lens was the, the, the Tessar. It's a little bit shorter. It actually doesn't project very much at all. But again, all the operations the same way. This was this guy, an MF Fang, uh, but he carefully engraved his name on it and on the case and in, also in Chinese as well. Thank you. Um, this is it. This is the uh, 10x1. Little tiny thing. Uh, the uh, and uh, has a little, very inexpensive uh, flip-up finder. And uh, but it is really, you can. This is one camera you can. really shoot very fast, very nice. Uh, they, a lot cheaper, the construction is much cheaper and you will notice if you work with this thing, uh, it, it, this one only has a Novar lens on it, but uh, it's again, it's still very, very easy to operate. Now, back behind me here, I don't know if you can see it all, I've got a bunch of other things here. Uh, this is this is the, uh, the quantometer uh, for it. Every uh, Zeiss product had a condometer that fit that particular camera, the size of the things and the what have you. Very nice one. It's a later one. And as a later one, it's got a little bit of a shroud around the viewfinder. Uh, yeah. If you wanted a waist level finder, you could have that too. You know, just, there you go. Um, have you. This is the, uh, this is the adapter that I had made. Flip a Nikon lens on it and you can load it on a camera. Uh, I wouldn't necessarily say that would be the thing that you would choose to do. The one other lens that I would show you here, uh, it looks like a regular Tessar, but you notice it has no arm with the prisms. And it has a yellow filter mounted on back. And you can see it's got an MF number. Uh, and it has no diaphragm. So this lens will only operate at F2.8, basically wide open. And you think, well, that's kind of crazy. What was it going on? Well, if you think about it, if you put this, can this lens on a 10X uh, and you're restricted to 200 or 400 of a second, now you've got a... a Basically, it's a snapshot camera that you can throw in an airplane and you can go out and you can go click, click, click and not have to worry about focus, focus at infinity, focus or exposure or anything else because you're up in the sky with bright sunlight. You don't have to worry about clouds. So this is an, this is an, uh, an aerial lens. And uh, I've only ever seen three of these. Uh, this one in black. The others were in natural aluminum or yellow. So it's they were obviously handmade. Uh, to the description for the either the loop flop or, or what have you. Okay. Um, anything else that you guys got questions about? Yes, we have a few questions. Uh, right. <laughs> Reich, uh, Reich Lent is asking Can you describe how a contameter works for close up photography? All right. Very, very good. Uh, Give me a second. The first part of the device is gone. You notice it has two shoes on it, one here and one here. You put it on the back here, take, picking the shoe. One shoe is for farther away and the other shoe is closer. It, it cups the tilt. Then you pick your lens. And you slide your lens on, your close-up lens. You set your the major lens at infinity, okay? And you put this on. And then you take 
the appropriate little dinky shit little lens here and you slip that in here. Now, you're now set to focus at one distance. And you take your camera and you move it in and out until it's sharp in the rangefinder and you take your picture. So you have three distances that you can photograph uh, and you you set you pick the lens and you pick the the little thing that goes in the contometer and you set the contometer right direction and you shoot away the and you notice that this is one of the later they were it comes later and so it has a little shroud around it to give a little bit better protection to the okay the uh, uh, this is the uh, this is the uh, 1341, which was designed for the uh, Super High Conto. They use the same size slip-on filters, 37 millimeter slip-on filters. And of course, the iFan that works well with the 75 millimeter lens because the Super High Conto also uses the 75 millimeter lens as its normal lens. So I put this on, I can do close up work with the 75. But the nice thing is 1341 condometers are a lot more common, easier to find. They only made 300 of the ones for the 10. So you're, if you want one, you're going to have to be patient. Next question. Next question. Uh, Ken is asking, how many pictures do you get on a roll of 36 exposures? 50. 50. Okay. And Andrew is asking, what's the maximum shutter speed? Four hundredth of a second. Again, it's a larger shutter, so you can't don't get as high a speed. I was wondering about. Uh, you said that they were that they began uh, sales in 1938. Yeah. So when the war happened, how did like production of the cameras get affected by the materials that were needed to produce them, or was that not a problem? Oh, I, it was definitely a problem. Uh, I think that the. Uh, of course, Germany thought they'd have a quick war in 1939, and I think they tried to ignore, well, the, the war didn't start till September in 39, and I think most of the 10Xs that were manufactured had been manufactured already by September 39. Uh, they had a lot of problem with getting chromium to, for chromium cameras, which is why a lot, of, like, a lot of the Leicas during the war were just painted because they had a hard time getting chrome. Um, and, um, so, you know, the things were like that, but they were still advertising the 10X because the stores still had them. They still had stock in them all the way up to about 4041. But uh, after that, you just, if they didn't go to the military, basically, as I see, I was told, if we don't, the military hasn't ordered it, you will not manufacture it. So that's, that's basically that shut it all down. And of course, with the elimination of uh, the ICA factory in Dresden, they didn't have any way to manufacture any of this stuff anyway. Yeah. Um, when when you were at Rochester, what were you studying? Photography. And and um, I, that's what I thought. But uh, <laughs> when you were there um, next to the Eastman Museum. You were surrounded by people in the department. So what was it like sort of working with older cameras during that time were, were people around you well this was this was back in this was back in, in uh 1971 and there was still i mean it was still a film era there were still people using uh i mean i was shooting with nikon sps and, and s2s you know along with nikon f's and uh having no problem with it i mean people would say oh yeah that's that, like that um but uh, yeah, I was I was also working in four by five uh, in in the studio as part of my coursework. But uh, I've stuck pretty much to thirty five millimeter. Uh, and uh, what I had a deal I, I picked up when I was in the Air Force. I was in the Air Force for four years in photography, and I picked up a whole slew of Polaroid film four by five and stuff like that. And so I just had a Polaroid back for my four by five, and I would shoot Polaroid and people say, how you can afford it? Well, it's, the government paid me for it, so. <laughs> That's great. And uh, when you were uh, in the Air Force, what was the state of aviation, aviation photography then? Like what was the technology that 
were was being... I worked in a, I worked uh, I was part of a, a photo reconnaissance squadron okay the RF4C jets that went out and took pictures and they were shooting nine inch or five inch wide film that came in th in 500 or 1000 foot rolls with aerial cameras and they would go out and fly over things and take panoramic pictures or, or stuff like that and go click, 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 click. They would bring the film back in magazines and we would rotate it into Versamat processors and we would go in one end and five minutes later you would finish negatives coming out the other end and the photo intelligence people would look at it and they would work directly with the negatives with the pilots and navigators identifying the targets. We were training them, we were in Texas. We were training these guys who of course immediately shipped to either uh, uh, Vietnam or Thailand after they finished their training with us. So basically we were training them to how to shoot pictures of you know, factories in North Vietnam or what have you. Uh, so yeah, it was, it was interesting stuff. And of course we had a full, full photo lab within the process and yeah. Were you, um... Did anyone else that you knew at the time have interest in 10x or no. were you all talking about I wouldn't, I wouldn't have known a 10x from a from a from a beetle camera or something you know it was i i discovered the 10x when i actually went to the um, the, uh, the website with the guy in oregon's name uh, uh, that has the thing old cameras i have to mind escapes me a second but he he covered all the different ice cameras in his website and i read about 10 i said so that's kind of cool you know it's tax action camera and you know things like that and one came up at a price i could afford i bought it came from france and it came with this military lens on it that was coded and, and the description on ebay didn't even say that so i was thrilled and uh, i had no the only problem with that camera is that the frame counter advances two numbers per shot. So if it says I've taken 20 pictures, I've only actually taken 10. And now the second one I got, it works fine as long as you don't use the self timer. If I use the self timer, it jams. And I have to take it apart to unjam it. Um, so the, and the, the one that I got that the 27 millimeter lens came with, and the guy, the owner, that came from Rochester and it actually had a, custom made case to hold it with the finder on it and the advanced gear was shot and i had a set of 10x parts i bought on ebay and i just replaced the gears wow that's so, great it must have when the when you got the first one and you held it in your hands did you sort of have an instant affinity with it oh yeah, it yeah, oh, yeah. Not... Was, yes it was just you know i, was, I mean i have i have a, 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 a contacts and and it, it doesn't do nearly it for me. I have a Leica, I've never even run film for it, you know, even though I admit the Leicas are very well made, beautiful cameras, but they somehow didn't have never clicked with me. I mean, I've taken pictures with Leicas, but uh, yeah. Uh, Joel has a question. If a person was interested in purchasing a 10X2, what are the things to watch out for that could present problems? Uh, as I said, the frame counter uh, has a tendency to go on the fritz. Uh, if it's been well taken care of, the you know your compor shutters are very durable, um, and I've never had a compor shutter, the shutter itself, go on the fritz on me. Um, and I've never had the focusing mounts freeze on me, although the one I have it's it's a little stiff, but. Uh, you do not want to take the focusing mechanism apart under any circumstances. The first 75 that I caught, the focus was jammed. And I later figured out that the gears that went from the focusing helior to the prisms, the gears were rubbing against the side. And there's actually screws in there. Um, I don't know if you can see it in the picture. If you look in the back of the lens, there's actually uh, two, you see two screws there? Mm -hmm. They're on an eccentric. And you by moving those two screws, the gears, are, they set into a metal uh, set in. And the gears show where what, those two screws govern where those gears were, and they were jammed. Well, I had no clue as to what was, I was doing. I took the whole thing apart. It took me about five hours to get the prisms back to the right tooth so that they would focus 
properly and give me a horizontal shift of the image. So don't do it. <laughs> <laughs> a couple more questions. Uh, Andrew says, if one could find one on eBay, what do you think the price would be? Well, the, I, there's about four or five on eBay right now, and they want between seven hundred and eight hundred dollars, except for the ones with the twenty-seven million worth meter, and they want three thousand. Now, I paid I paid seven hundred dollars for my ten X with the twenty-seven and the finder. So you know you have to be either you have to be willing to spend a lot of money or be very patient. Uh, the most I paid for. A 10X, I think, was $470, and that's the one that came with the contometer, which is why I bought it. Uh, and it would have gone higher, except the guy uh, misspelled 10X, I think. That's, uh, his, that's his problem. <laughs> John is asking, have you used a Tonica 3? Uh, no. I think, um, John, are you I, there? I, I, had a, I, had a, I had a super nettle briefly. Yeah. Of course, the shutter ribbons broke. Right. Uh, so I sold it. Um, uh, the, uh, I have a super Iconta. Okay. Uh, a. Right. Yeah. Which I really like. Yeah. Now, uh, I asked that question because the Contica 3 also has a advanced lever. Yes. Yeah, like yeah. that. So. Yeah, yeah. They did sell. There's they sell. There's a um, what is it that there's a German fil uh, film manufacturer that made a, a lever action camera also. Yeah, that yeah. Uh, so no, I have a the only other German camera I have is uh, this 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 lovely uh, uh Superconta A. Uh, I picked it up for fifty bucks. So, and it it operates. It's the, the bellows is intact. It makes absolutely gorgeous pictures. So, but unfortunately, the uh, the, the the prisms for the rangefinder are out, and I'm not sure if I want to take it apart to fix them. What um, else? One question that Reich had, I see that in the Snapshots article, you, you published articles in the Nikon Historical Society Journal and Zeiss Historica's Journal, and Reich was asking, is the Nikon Historical Society still operating because he hasn't seen the journal in a while? <laughs> yeah, I just, I just, I just paid, my, paid my dues, so I still get it every quarter. You know, the, Bob Rodolani's still running the, the show, and uh, it's still, they still have a journal. And they're trying to get together a uh, convention in Germany this September. I don't know if I will be going to Germany, but uh, mm -hmm. so it's still going. I don't think that there's as many people in involved with it as there used to be, but that's the thing, you know, I mean, the Zeiss, the Zeiss historical, so I mean, it basically disbanded it. You know, they, people just meet on, on Facebook. The journal hasn't been published for what, three years now, I think. At the top of the chat, everyone, if you scroll up, I posted links. Um, like uh, Wes suggested, go to your local independent bookstore and request that they order the books. But uh, there's also a couple of links to Amazon for both books at the top of the chat. Um, Reich says, thanks for the update. Um, and uh, one of the things that I was thinking about when you talked about it being marketed to the public and to people who wanted to capture those moments is that you know if if during wartime you know people might not have been taking happy pictures you know things did journalists use this camera at all you know i have never got the impression that journalists used the 10x uh it was um they were using either Leicas or contacts. If they were using 35 millimeter at all, of course, you know, American journalists they weren't allowed. Pretty much didn't do 35. That was they were using four by fives or whatever. Um, I they I, I'm, the military used it because you know you could operate with your gloves on hmm. very nicely. I mean, if you're and if you know if you've ever tried to operate a wine lever wine uh, knob wine camera with heavy gloves on, you know the it takes a while. 
And uh, so that was probably there. I think that uh, I'm surprised that the Navy didn't use them more than they did because if you're in a submarine, it doesn't matter whether it's 24 by 36 or 24 by 24 when you're shooting through a periscope. But apparently they issued contacts kits to every submarine uh, that had a, a sonar and uh, a 135 millimeter sonar in the kit. But the 10X was used by the Navy. Uh, and when they did, if you saw in the picture there, they had had extra large levers on them. They took the self timers off and, you know, things like modified them in different ways to make them easier to operate. Uh, no, I think it just, once the, once the war started, you know, they would, they just weren't selling them anymore. Yeah. But the marketing, if you look at the marketing, you can find yeah, every once in a while, somebody's trying to sell a 10X ad, ad on eBay. And the marketing is all aimed towards very casual friends, you know, girlfriends giggling together and boyfriend, girlfriend and, and, you know, snapshot type stuff. I mean, that was what they were aiming towards. Uh, Speak German. What? Do you speak German? Nein. <laughs> I was just looking at the ads and one of the words that jumped out at me was schnell auf Zug. Does anybody speak German? I, I looked it up and it seemed to translate as like a quick lifting or almost almost like elevator um, that was in the ad that you showed us. Um, I wonder if that's just referring to the quick action of the camera, but... Um, yeah, uh, and um, Andrew says great program, and I agree. This was really uh, wonderful. The images were great. I really love seeing the insides of the camera. And you know, I don't like I don't like to see the inside of the camera. <laughs> well, uh, I hope you'll come to Photographica in April. Um, oh, Rick Reich has another. Uh, message Nerwin designed the designed the combat graphic 70 millimeter with a yes. periscope adapter yes the the the, the giant contacts <laughs> yeah after the war when Nerwin's contract he had a 10-year contract with ice when it ended in 1947 they offered to bring the united states as part of operation paperclip and he said yes so he moved to rochester he was working for Graflex designed that camera and then he worked for Kodak and he designed what format? Does anybody know what format camera he designed? 126 format. The Instamatic camera was a Nerwin invention. This was the most successful camera formats ever put together in its square format. Yeah, he he's the guy who liked a square format. I this guess so. Yeah. <laughs> but, I, I mean, love you, that. Think of, you think of how successful the Instamatic was. Yeah. Oh, so, uh, yeah, he was, yeah, he was responsible for the design of that. He died in, I think, in the 1980s in Rochester. Yeah. I wish I had met the guys because he sounds like he's a cool guy. That was my next question whether you'd ever met him. <laughs> no, no. Michael, did the uh, 10X require a separate, its own film cartridge, or could it no. take 35 millimeter film? It takes standard 35 millimeter magazines. Word of warning, though, the the way the uh, rewind uh, prongs are designed, they're really designed for the way magazines were designed in the 1930s. If you put a modern magazine in there, it won't seat all the way up very well, and as a result, the film will tend to uh, ride a little bit out of the grooves. It uh, doesn't seem to affect things too much. and It makes it harder to advance because of things like that. But uh, um, if you, I don't know if you can see it in this picture here, but uh, in the opening picture of the camera there, but you see how the picture kind of rides into the sockets there? Yeah. Okay. You see that that's what's happened. Um, but yeah, I, I'm, I'm just shoot, I just shoot, shoot the Kodak film in it, no problem at all. Of course, you, you have a take-up spool, you got to load it on the take-up spool and make sure that it's, you know, advancing all right. But, uh, yeah. The only thing is, when I send my film in process, because I don't run my own darkroom, I say, 
do not cut, do not mount. And then I scrounge the internet for 24 by 24 slide mounts. And uh, then I mount my own slides. Yeah. Does anyone have any questions they wanted to add? Check our uh, clearance table or dollar table, and you may find some square, a lot of square slide mounts for next to nothing, Michael. Oh, I can find them, but they're all glass. I don't like glass mounts. We might have cardboard ones too. There's a lot of that stuff on the dollar tables. Oh, what that the, at the Photographica? Yes. I'll take a look if I get up there. Yeah. Okay. I'll look for that. Anyone else? Well, I think I think I'll... related. Sorry? Having a hard time hearing you, Andrew. No. How about now? That's better. What how about a question that's totally unrelated? Uh, sure. Does anyone that's attending know uh, someone in the area that will build a uh, a uh, <clears throat> I have an eight by ten camera that I actually bought from uh, Reich, and it needs a new bellows. I have no idea where you can get a bellows for an eight by ten. Well, we'll work we'll work into that at the end when we're okay. Social okay. <laughs> Told you it was totally unrelated. <laughs> um, thanks. So uh, I just want to invite everyone to unmute and give Wes a round of applause for his fabulous presentation. Thank you so much. And you are a FISNI member now, so you will be, uh, <laughs> you'll be receiving your snapshots and you'll be in the loop on all the things that are going on in the upcoming months. I hope you join us for, for more presentations. It was great having you with us. Thank you. And if you ever um, want to know about, if you ever want to know about, uh, Acarets or acarels or lordomats, I could probably talk about that too. Yes. <laughs> um, yeah, and snapshots, um, just a reminder to everyone, um, you know, snapshots is, you know, always looking for interesting subjects and, you know, other than the, the event that's going on that month. So, um, you know, a good, good thing to remember if you, if you have an interest of something like that, you want to contact Bonnie um, to do that. And what, oh, oh, before we close out, um, next month, we are going to be uh, hosting uh, Josh Farr uh, of the Vermont Center for Photography. He's gonna be our speaker. So he'll be talking about VCP uh, in March on the 5th. Um, we are um, going to, uh, the Peabody Essex Museum, March 11th, to see um, Power and Perspective, Early Photography in China. The tour has been booked at this point. There was an email that went out um, asking what day people would prefer to go. So if you didn't respond to that email and you still have interest in attending, please email me directly at programs, P-R-O-G-R-A-M-S, at Disney.org because we already have arrangements for a certain number of people at the uh, show, which is at 1030 and the restaurant at 1230. Um, so uh, we're looking forward to that and seeing you there. Um, and do you have any questions for us, Wes? <laughs> no, I'm, I'm fine. You guys are great. And I really enjoyed this and I hope you guys enjoyed it too, so. Yes, we did. Um, can I can I pitch in on one thing, Dana? Sure. Wes and like other other authors and that sort of thing. Uh, if you have cameras that you want to have a little short story in our snapshots newsletter, by all means, please offer to do that for uh, Bonnie uh, Regelman, who is the person who has made snapshots happen for 
uh, more, I think almost two decades at this point. I think the um, getting those cameras of the month items up in, in snapshots, apropos of you're getting the 10 x sending a note back to us about other aspects of the 10 x it's, it's just exactly the kind of conversation that all of us uh, at FISNI uh, like to see and hear and read. So thank you again, Wes. Thank Thanks, you. Ray. I did, uh, Bonnie, I hope it's okay. I put your email address in the chat for those who would like to uh, submit material for snapshots. Um, and I think that's it for the program. And uh, Wes, we'd love if, you, if you'd like to stick around. We usually have a round of socializing afterwards where everybody reverts to gallery view and uh, sort of sits around the campfire. So um, I want to thank you again because it was a really wonderful program. And um, we'll send you the link so that you can share this with others once it's up on YouTube. Uh, one, one last thing here is that uh, you have a link for my blog, right? Yes, up at the top of the chat. I can post okay, that in uh, again. Yeah, so okay, to everybody, take a look there because I cover a lot of different cameras on stuff. It's called Old Night Content, <laughs> old night content Other Photographic Items, but I cover a wide range of stuff. So you might enjoy taking a look, okay? Thank you. I'm just pasting that in again with the correct link so that people can actually click on it. Um, Wes Loader and Nikon.blogspot.com. Um, and uh, thank you everyone for attending. It was really great to see everyone and hear the questions. And uh, I will see you next month with uh, the Vermont Center for Photography. Thanks everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Dana. Wow. Andrew, how big, what, is that an 8 by 10 view camera you're looking for? We have bellows. You bring, you bring the system with you, take a look at it. Yeah, um, a little problem with the sound, I think. Yeah. My computer system is terrible. Sorry. How's that? Sort of a little better. It's hard to tell. Um, let me just go to the website. I'm going to just listen. You guys talk. <laughs> <laughs> what kind of bellows do we have? We've got quite an assortment of bellows at the warehouse for uh, old cameras. Uh, I don't know if there's anything big. I know there are smaller ones, but uh, I'm not sure whether there's anything that big, but there's a particular box I can look at Wednesday when I go in. Mm -hmm. We might have it. I'm gonna drop down there sometime. I'll, uh, I don't know if you can hear me. I'll try to drop down there and I'll call you ahead of time. No. No, we could hear it. I heard it. Um, ben, are you there? I'm here. How are you, Dana? I'm good. I have a question. How long did the anniversary episode wind up being once we edited it? I think it was like around an hour and 45. Okay. Is is that, that's up already, right? Yeah, it is. It's up okay. on YouTube. Yeah, it was it was really good though. Yeah, that was that was great. That was quite an evening. So I'm really glad we have that archived. Um, you know, Dana, one thing I do want to note, um, um, just mention while we're all here, is that um, FISNI board members are going to be reelected at the end of like this coming year. So for people who are thinking about getting involved, it's a really good time to start to reach out about that if you're interested in being on the board. And I think we we do need like more board membership as well. So if anyone has time to um, volunteer, I think just knowing that it's coming up in um, like December, January elections, it's a good time to think about volunteering. 
I agree. <laughs> uh, I, I might also mention that uh, we're going to need a lot of help for the photographica, uh, considering that's going to we could get as many as five hundred people. So uh, we need volunteers to help with setup and all kinds of volunteers to help with various administrative things during photographica. <clears throat> So if you can call John Dockery and let, uh, and let him know uh, what, what you might be interested in, please do. Sounds good. Dana, if, if nobody else has any comments, maybe we should just call it a night. Yes, it's a, the group is a little smaller this evening. Does anyone else have anything they wanted to add? Okay. Um, well, thanks, Ben, as always. Yeah, thanks, it's good to see everyone. Have a good night, everyone. Thanks, Sean. Good night. Good night.